Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wassalamu rasulullah. This is Yusuf Estes, and we're talking on the subject in our series about clearing the fog, removing the misconceptions and misunderstandings that many people have concerning Islam and the teachings of Islam. In clearing this fog, it's the responsibility of the Muslims to properly present our case. Many times we have a specific question which is very harsh in its manner and nature, often attacking Islam and the things that Islam stands for. So it's important for us, first of all, to know the answer to the question, of course, but at the same time to realize what is the methodology or the menhaj for answering the question in the proper way, according to Islam. Of course, we're going to say it's based on the Qur'an and the teachings of Muhammad called the Hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, I want to give an example of a question in this particular series today and see what you would say if somebody asked you this. They come to you and they say, you're a Muslim. You say, yes, I'm Muslim. Okay, we heard about your God. Your God's called Allah, right? You say, yes. Well, you said this God is where? And how do you worship this God? Because what we have observed from television and in magazines and newspapers is that there's this black box out in the desert. And it looks like you guys are bowing down to this black box. So we want to know, do you guys really worship a black box in the desert? Well, that's a good question. And how would you answer that? This is what we're going to be talking about in this segment. To begin with, inshallah, we as Muslims know that we have a responsibility to provide the best possible answer in the best possible way. And this is for me, you, and all of us to be able to properly deal with the question. Even a question when you don't know the answer, you still have to attempt to give some understanding to remove this fog of misunderstanding. And we do so by telling them this statement, thank you for asking me about my religion. That's very important to let them know that you are as concerned as they are about their interest in Islam. And they'll be surprised because they were expecting you were going to come back with no, yes, you know, some kind of rebuttal. But instead, what you're going to be saying to them is, thank you for asking me about my religion. And they're going to go, huh? The next thing you would do is mention to them that in Islam, we must say the truth. This is very essential. We always say the truth. If we don't, we can go to hell forever. So it's not an option for us. We're not allowed to lie. As a matter of fact, it's considered a correct answer in Islam if I say I don't know. Because if I don't know, it's better to say that than to make up something, isn't it? So Allah gives a reward to the ones who say, I don't know. Laraf, I don't know. And then, after we've communicated to them the idea that we have to tell the truth, the next thing is to tell them we have the proof. Everything in Islam is authenticated, recorded, and preserved for 1,400 years. And this is not by accident. Allah has preserved this deen or way of life of Muslims so that we today know what Islam was teaching even 1,400 years ago, and it's still applicable today in our real life. Let's go back to that particular question and examine it a little bit. If somebody came to you and said, why do you Muslims worship a black box in the desert? That's usually the way a harsh question comes. It comes with a statement in it that's not true. So we get rid of the harsh statement first and tell them that that's not correct. We don't worship a black box in the desert. But if your question is, who do we worship? Then we're most happy to tell you who we worship. And why the focus on this black box in the desert, the Kaaba, what we're talking about there? Now, that's a fair question, and we would like to answer that. But by the way, when we're giving you the answer to the question, if you find yourself saying, gee, that's nice, I like that for me, or any of the things that we say seem to go along with your own nature and what you already believe, then are you going to be prepared to consider your position and begin to worship your Lord without any partners? Because you see, that's what Islam is really all about. It's about worshiping God, the one God of the universe with no partners. At that stage, they're going to be saying, what? Because you're going to take them aback a bit. They're going to say, what's he talking about? Sounds like he's trying to convert me or something. And in fact, we're not. We're not trying to convert anybody, but what we're trying to do here is to present the clear message. When we do that, then the people begin to understand what Islam really is about. 
oftentimes Muslims themselves have a difficulty because they don't know and they don't even know who to ask or where to turn for the answers. And of course, this is a part of the reason for this series called Lifting the Fog. Somebody asks you about our worship in general. It's always to explain the Rabbil Alameen. What do I mean? When we talk about Allah, we have something very beautiful in Islam. We have the word for God. You don't have it in English. I'm going to tell you that up front. There is no word in English for the real God. The word in English for God is the same as it is for a false God. Anything worshipped in English is a God. In Arabic, the word for God is Elah, not Allah. Anything worshipped is a God. A rock, a stick, a stone, a bone, anything that people can see, hear, smell, touch, feel, can be worshipped. And that's a God or an Elah. In English, you spell it G. O D, But in English, when you want to talk about the one almighty God of Abraham and Adam and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, we're talking then about Allah. But you don't have that in English. You say, yes, we do. We just put a big G. Well, if you're starting the sentence out, you have to put a big G anyway, so you wouldn't know if you're talking about God, the God, or God, a God. In Arabic, it's real simple because the word Allah doesn't need to be capitalized. In fact, there are no capital letters in the Hebrew, Aramaic, or Arabic language. It's very clear when you say Allah who you're talking about. The question now has presented an opportunity for us to discuss exactly who we worship and why. And then let them make the comparison in their own minds to what they've considered to be worship or a God in their own head according to their own religious background. What we say here is the description of the word Elah. Elah is something worshipped, anything worshipped. Auliha, that is the plural, gods. You put an S after the word God and you have gods. And that's Auliha in Arabic. But when you say Allah, there is no word like this in the English language. The closest they can come is to try to capitalize the G. But whenever you start a sentence, you capitalize a word anyway, so you wouldn't know if you started the sentence and it says God, if you're talking about a false God, a real God, a pagan God, or whatever is worshipped. With Arabic, it's clear because when you say Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha, it's Allah. And Allah is the proper name for God of Islam. This is the name for the God of Adam and Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and Jesus. And by the way, Moses is known to us as the progenitor of the same religion of Abraham, just as Jesus is the continuation of the message that came with the prophets before him, and just as Muhammad is the one continuing this message. This is not something new. This gives us the opportunity to talk about that as well. In our other programs, we've discussed in detail about the word Allah. But just for the sake of this one, I will touch on it again. Allah is not plural, and it has no gender. It's not male and not female. When Allah says he in the Quran, he's not referring to himself as male, but rather out of respect and dignity. There is not a she nor really a he when we talk about Allah because Allah is much more than something compared to his creation. The other thing is when it says us or we in the Quran, Allah is referring to himself in the royal capacity, not in plural. There is none with Allah. He has no partners. So, obviously, there's not two or three or four. If we understand this, it helps us in presenting the correct message here about the oneness of God. So, now we have opportunity to talk about the Tawheed or monotheism of Islam. 